So I was uh, here backstage listening to uh, Ray, and uh, when he said, are you having a tough week, uh, I was like, yes, I've had a tough week. It's great to see everybody, but man, I've had a tough, tough week. So can I bend your ear a little bit about what took place? So, uh, you know, many of you may or may not know, but I, I work as a... Uh, senior Vice President of a uh, cybersecurity company. I do sales, marketing, sales operations. And end of quarter is usually like the hardest time. So four times a year, I absolutely hate my job. Right? It's, it's all about, you know, I work for a public company, so it's all about reporting to Wall Street about our, our revenues. It's about meeting with shareholders. It's about dealing with the board of directors. And, um, you know, the, the end of the quarter is apps. I mean, I'm working 14, 15 hour days and I'm, and I'm trying to do the best that I can uh, to, to balance everything. But this past week, I happened to be in Arizona at a conference on the last week of the quarter. And so I'm there at a conference, I'm meeting with folks, but then I'm also trying to manage uh, deals that are coming through. I'm also trying to manage all my different teams and my employees and, um, let me just say that, that it, it was at the end of the week, which was Friday, which was the 1st of April, um, I was able to be in, just sit in my hotel room and just decompress for a moment. And I found myself kind of still in that mad rush. I'm not sure if you can relate, but like when you have weeks like that, you almost feel like your body is still reacting to the moment by moment things that need to be done and then there's no time to like relax and decompress. And it really made me think about what I had to share this weekend because I, I read this quote and it, it just, it hit me right between the eyes. It's, it's a woman, uh, her name is Corey and she says, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Mm. And it made me think about this idea of hurry and rush and distraction versus love. Because we know what the scriptures say, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. You know, it does not envy, it does not boast. And I thought, love takes time. Love takes commitment. Love takes patience. And then I thought, but if I'm running hurry, what, what happens? I end up snapping at my wife. I end up not meeting the needs of those around me. So why is this hurry and distraction so prevalent in our society? You know, I started thinking about people are just too busy to live emotionally healthy lives and spiritually rich lives that are vibrant and growing day to day. I don't know about you, but after this week, I felt like there was this gnawing feeling inside of me. I felt stuck, I felt empty, I felt like I was running from one meeting to another meeting to another. I started my mornings at 5 a.m. because I was on the West Coast time, so I had 8 a.m. calls on the East Coast time, and I went all the way through to dinner with clients, meeting with clients, it was, it was a week that I would not wish to replicate. And yet, I find at work, that's the way I am. I run from one thing to another, to another, to another. Why? Because our society rewards busyness. It even happens in the church. You know, we ask each other, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, doing good, just busy, just busy. You know, a lot of stuff going on. Don't we do that to each other sometimes? Or we prioritize other things and someone says, hey, we missed you. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I was just busy. You know, work had me tied down. I had to do a lot. Doesn't that happen? And oftentimes what happens is we're overscheduled. We're stressed about it. We're trying to do too much. And I believe that hurry and rushing around is the enemy of a spiritual life. 
Because love is patient, love is kind, love builds up, but hurry, rushing around, distraction tears down. Isn't that what it does? It tears away from the relationships that you have in the body. It tears away from your relationship with God. And so the great enemy of our spiritual lives is overscheduling, stressed out, ruthlessly hurrying through our lives. And you're probably asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? Steve, I thought you were going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, I can't talk about the Holy Spirit until we're ready to talk about the Holy Spirit. If we've all walked in here kind of the way I was feeling, which was hurried and rushed and thinking about what took place last week and what we didn't do at work and what, then I'm not ready to talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, oftentimes we look at the Bible in 20th century eyes and minds. And it, it's, it's the, I think the greatest travesty that we have is that we don't think about the way people lived in the first century. You see, in the first century, it was a totally agrarian society. They lived off the land. They didn't have iPhones. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have all these things. And so what they, what they had was they worked off the land. They had to plow the land. They had to prepare the soil. They had to plant the seed. Then they had to water it or allow God through the rain water it. And then they waited. And they waited and they harvested eight, nine, ten months later. The shepherds were there feeding the flocks and they just tended the flocks. And what did they do while they were? They were just in the moment. They worked the land. They tended the farms. The ship, they had lots and lots of time alone. They walked everywhere. What do we do now? We hop in our cars, we jet over there, and we turn on the radio, we listen to a podcast, and we very rarely have solitary moments without some form of distraction. A ping from your phone because of social media, someone texting you, someone calling you. This is the challenge that we have to remove the distractions and allow God to speak to us. In the first century, it wasn't any easier in the sense that they still had distractions. They just didn't have as many distractions as we did. What happens often is we assimilate that busyness into our culture. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Overschedule, overschedule. Because that is what people who are successful do. Two jobs, three jobs. Let me get another master's. And what this happens is when we assimilate this business and this culture of busyness into the church, it leads to God being marginalized in our lives. God becomes a piece of our lives, not our lives. It leads to a deteriorating relationship between God and others. Because we're so busy doing what we need to do, we don't have time for others. And then Christians become more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions. We look to the world to help us with our children. We look to the world to help us with our marriages. We look to the world to give us that relationship that we want. Instead of looking to God. That better be God calling. <laughs> and when we do that, it leads to us conforming to this culture of busyness. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Overload. Overload our lives. I have to say that I'm guilty of that like anyone. My daughter is here. You can ask her after church. But one of the Rivera mantras was, if you're not tired, you haven't done enough. That has been my sin. Wanting to do more, wanting to do more, wanting to do more. And I've been so convicted by this. In our culture, we view things that are slow as negative. We like things fast. When we're at a restaurant and the service is lousy, what do we call it? It was slow. What do we do? We go to Yelp. <laughs> service was slow. When we're watching a movie or a book, that's slow. What do we, you know, we, it's, it's boring. We could, oh, that movie was so slow. It took so long to get started. The message is clear. 
Slow is bad. Fast is good. But when we look at God, God turns the world upside down. And our value system has to be turned on its head. Hurry and busyness are of the devil. Slow is what we see in Jesus. Someone asked me just the other day, have you ever seen Jesus run in the scriptures? I had to think about that. I was like, no, I haven't. He wasn't running from one place to the He was just walking and he was in that moment. See, the movies have us believe, and, and, and my wife is, she's not here, she, she's at a, a, at a retreat, but my wife believes that people can meet, two people can meet, fall in love, and get married in 90 minutes. Because she loves Hallmark. She loves the Hallmark movies. But see, that happens only on the screen, not in real life. Relationships have to be built. Relationships have to be forged. And if that's the case with another person, you know that's the case with God. So in real life, love takes time. It takes investment. We need to remove distractions, slow down, and we need to listen. Now on to the topic of the Holy Spirit. Are we ready now? I confess my sin to you. I feel much better I'm going to repent. I have repented. I've decided no more end of quarter madness. We're going to change the way we operate in our home. And we're going to start slowing things down. Why? So that we can hear the spirit. When you're racing around, I know at my house, when the kids were younger, the most challenging time was Sunday mornings before church. We were shoveling food in the kids' mouths. We were running around. I was going, let's go, let's go. We're going to be late. We're going to be late. And, and that was the wrong lesson to teach my children about Sunday mornings. And yet, I know that we probably all had similar experiences on the way here. Not all of us, some of us. And so I want you to think about the way we live our lives and the lessons that we're teaching those who watch us. Whether it's people at work, whether it's people at home, right? We have to be careful of the lessons that we're teaching. You know, Scott, about three weeks ago, he did a fantastic job talking about uh, the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And uh, he talked about how the Holy Spirit creates. He looked at Genesis 1. He talked about the Holy Spirit animates and the Holy Spirit sustains. And uh, he talked about this, this Hebrew word, ruach, from, from uh, the word that the Hebrews use for spirit, breath, life, God's presence, and his power. And he talked about how the Holy Spirit is creative, it's supportive, and it's a guiding presence here in our lives to help us accomplish God's will. Today I have a couple of points. And the first is that the Spirit spoke God's words. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the Spirit interacted in the Old Testament. And as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you're going to see a lot of the same things because the Spirit, like God, He is consistent. He doesn't change. What we see the Spirit move and do in the Old Testament, you're going to see it exactly in the New Testament. And so the Spirit spoke God's Word. In the, in the Old Testament, one of the coolest things for me is when the Spirit connected God to His words to the people. And He chose prophets. He chose men and women in the Bible to speak His word. And you hear His word proclaimed authoritatively by the prophets. If you read in the Old Testament, you see that these men and women, they spoke in such a manner that no one else spoke. They spoke with authority. They spoke revolutionary and revelatory words. And people knew that they, there was a prophet before them. The Old Testament saints, they received God's word through the prophets. So those who followed God listened to those prophets and they said, wow, that is what God wants us to do. In Isaiah 59, verse 21 
It's a great scripture. We know Isaiah 59 really well as a church, right? Where he talks about sin separates us from God, and then he goes through and he talks about they're, they're like blind people groping along the, the wall. But in verse 21, he says something pretty powerful as a conclusion of this thought about how sin separates us from God, how we're blinded and in darkness groping along the wall. And in verse 21, he says, hang on, I'm going to show my age a little bit. Oh, there you go. In verse 21, it says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, who is on you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth, or from the mouths of your children, or from the mouths of their descendants, from this time on and forever, says the Lord. You know, God says... His spirit, he's, he's saying it through the prophet Isaiah, that his spirit would, would put the words in their mouths to speak. In 2 Samuel 23, he says to David, or, or David says that through the spirit, the Lord spoke through him. That's uh, 2 Samuel 23 too. The, that the spirit spoke through David. This is what the Holy Spirit his activity, his power, his purpose was to speak God's words through men and women. You know, if you turn over to Deuteronomy, it's a great scripture too. In Deuteronomy, if you're not familiar with the book of Deuteronomy, you know, Deuteronomy itself is, is the second telling of the law of Moses. Moses had to retell the people. And uh, I find that interesting because I'm a hard-headed guy sometimes. I need to be told multiple times. And uh, even if it's as simple as, Steve, go get some milk. If my Arlene says, Steve, go get some milk from the grocery store. Uh, sometimes she has to tell me twice because I'm only half listening. Maybe I'm not listening. Maybe the Israelites are similar. right? So Moses had to tell this story twice, but he said this again. And in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verse 14, He's telling the people. He's commanding them as he's preparing for the end of his life. And he says, the word is very near to you. Verse 14, chapter 30. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. Moses is reminding them that God, because of their relationship, because of their calling, because of their special calling from God to be his people, they had his word on their mouth. It wasn't just for Moses to speak from God. It was for them to share with one another, to encourage one another. Today, if your heart is to serve God, and you are a disciple of Jesus, then the word is on your heart. For one reason and one reason only, to help you obey it, to share with those around you here today, whether it's at church, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, to inspire and encourage each other to continue in the fight. Amen. There is nothing more powerful than when God chooses an individual to spread his word. See, the Holy Spirit is present when the gospel is shared. There is there is just nothing more powerful than when someone speaks his word. And you see it in the Old Testament where men and women are prompted and they are dealing with the pressures of society pushing on them. And they go, no, I'm proclaiming God's word. Imagine what our fellowship would be like if we chose to simply allow God to use every single one of us. What would this service look? What would be different if we walked in speaking God's words. You don't have to memorize scripture. You simply have to allow the spirit to prompt you. Secondarily, the spirit rested and came upon people. Look in Numbers chapter 27. I got to make sure I keep moving. In Numbers 27. 
You know, the Holy Spirit, most scholars believe that the acts of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament were temporary. Meaning that they were not a permanent residing. God would come upon someone. And there's lots of examples of it. Where God would come upon someone, inspire them to do something great, but not remain with that person. God's Spirit would come upon someone, empower them, allow them to do great things, and then go back. This contrasts the New Testament where the Spirit personally and permanently is an indwelling in those who are baptized disciples. And we're going to learn about that in, in the coming uh, weeks to come. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 16, it talks about this deposit that God gives to baptized believers. As a deposit, He lives inside of us. Yet in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon believers to do God's will. We're going to read one scripture, and then I'm going to make some references to some others. That you can take note of. But it's pretty powerful when you, when you think about it. Numbers 27, verse 12. Again, this is when Moses is preparing Joshua to lead the people. God has spoken to Moses and said, you've been a faithful servant, but you're not going to enter the promised land. You need, to, you need to train someone else. God then chose uh, Joshua. And verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, go up to the mountain in the Abraham range. And see the land that I have given the Israelites. So he allowed Moses to look into the promised land, but not step into it. And that's a whole other story and a reason why. But it breaks my heart to think that Moses led them out of Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, and, and wasn't able to enter the promised land. After you have seen it too, uh, it says, after you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. Verse 15, Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God of the spirits of all mankind, appoint a man over this community. Let me, let me stop there just for a moment. God told him, you're going to be my deliverer. God spoke to him face to face. And yet at this point, because of decisions that Moses made, he could not enter the promised land. God, he, you know, and, and Moses had the dream. He led them through the Red Sea. He led them through the desert. The 40 years of marching through the desert, a pillar of cloud during the day, a pillar of fire at night. God saw the presence of God. And yet he would not walk into the promised land. Do you hear Moses' acceptance of the change in the dream? I, that, I just, it hit me just now. That is so convicting. Because I think I know what God's dream is for my life. But when God chooses a different course, I pray, and I hope you do too, to have a heart of Moses. Because Moses said, okay, God, then appoint somebody. To lead them. Wow. At some point in my life, I will be led by someone much younger than me. How challenging is that? I don't know. I, 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 anyway, that one was free. Man, convicted when you get convicted when you read the word.